Hi there, and welcome again to the Ivory Tower Collections. In today's video, I'm going to show you the method I use to repair the most common problem on the Atari 5200 controller, and that is that you usually suffer from non-responsive button functions on the top row for the start, pause, and reset, as well as non-responsive fire buttons. And the good news is, is that in most cases, this is a real easy fix. There are some expensive ways to fix this, and then there is the much cheaper way to fix this, which is what I do. Now, I'm not gonna say which method is better. I can only tell you that I've been doing this uh, with these Atari 5200 controllers for just shy of 20 years now. And in all my time, uh, my method usually lasts for about three or four years before I have to crack the controller open and do it again. So I'd say that for the amount of money I save and for as little time as it really takes to do this, um, I think I'm coming out ahead on that. So here's what we do. Again, we know what the problem is. We need to fix it. We got non-responsive buttons and I'm gonna show you how we do that. So in this video, we're gonna fix that. I'm gonna show you how to properly disassemble it and uh, put it back together. So here we go. First, the tools. You need a number two Phillips. That's a staple with almost every repair job on these old consoles. You need a flat blade number one screwdriver. That comes in handy for a couple of other areas. You're going to need a good pair of scissors. <clears throat> You're also going to need some double-sided tape. Um, and it's double-sided because it's sticky on both the top and bottom side of the tape. That's used for part of the reassembly process and to help in cleaning. You're also going to need some Q-tips so you can clean stuff. Obviously you'll need more than one, but you know, you get the idea. <clears throat> You're also going to need something to clean with. So I've got uh, this high concentrated electrical grade alcohol that I use, that I can buy locally. Uh, if for some reason that fails to do the job, I also can use this lovely stuff. It's called Deoxid. Uh, it's an off-brand of a more popular one known as Deoxit, but uh, it works just as well for me and I can buy it locally and uh, it, it's, it's really good stuff. I don't have to use this too often, but it's safe to use on all plastics and it's a really strong concentrated contact cleaner. You're also going to need some card stock. You don't need a piece this big, but you need, uh, you, need, you need a pretty good sizable piece of card stock. You can also use the back of an old envelope, so if you have some junk mail laying around, you can use that as well. And then uh, probably the final piece of this puzzle that we need is this, foil tape. Yeah, you don't need to roll this big, of course. But this is used to bring and provide a new surface point, a new conductive surface point for the uh, buttons inside the controller. Um, you can get the uh, foil tape from pretty much any hardware store. It's usually in the area where uh, HVAC stuff is located, like for duct repair. You can also find smaller rolls that will work just as well, because I used them before originally, at auto parts stores and uh, it's usually called chrome repair tape so you can go into an auto parts store and just ask the clerk there for some chrome repair tape and they'll probably direct you to the area you need to be in and so that will also work you obviously don't need a huge giant roll like this you really only need a piece of about one inch by one inch square to do the job so yeah those are the tools and uh, I'll show you how we use them so let's take this thing apart and get to uh, get cracking. Okay, so now let's talk about how to properly disassemble the Atari 5200 controller. You're going to need your number two Phillips and possibly the small flat blade screwdriver, number one size screwdriver I spoke of as well. We'll set those off to the side. Now to take apart the 5200 controller, you have three anchor screws on the bottom of the housing and that requires your number two Phillips. So we'll do that first. All right. 
Now, once those are apart, the other thing you need to do, and you need to be aware of this, is that you have to remove this top row of buttons and the bezel that holds them in place. If you don't do this, then when you try to take the two halves of the controller apart, what will usually happen is very likely you'll end up tearing or uh, severely damaging the Mylar Flex circuit that is underneath these buttons. And that's because throughout the entire controller is basically one large piece of Mylar Flex circuitry. And that's what all of the buttons make contact with. So yeah, gotta get this top row of buttons off and I'll show you the method to use for that. Now this is where the flat blade screwdriver comes in. <clears throat> what I'll usually do is either put the screwdriver under between the start button on the edge of it and the edge of the uh, underneath the bezel or you can also do it on the reset side either side will work and what you do is, is you just kind of pull down to wedge the bezel up off of there however doing this will usually damage the bezel because it's a fairly soft plastic so when you go to wedge this in there and push down on it uh, you'll end up putting dimples and some pretty good dings in this so to prevent that you can use that piece of cardstock I mentioned earlier. So it's actually got kind of a dual purpose. So you're gonna see that I'm gonna put the cardstock down here, and then I'm going to take the flat blade screwdriver, in this case, I'm gonna put it under the reset, between the reset and the edge of the bezel, and holding that cardstock in place, I'm going to pry up on the bezel like that until it comes loose. Perfect. And then take the uh, rubber carbon dot buttons off, or the carbon pad buttons off for the uh, start, pause, and reset. And you'll see, if you take a look on this uh, card stock here, you'll see that it did put a pretty good amount of force on that. And you can imagine if you were just putting that straight on the plastic of the bezel, that would dent it pretty badly. So that's, that's how I, I protect the bezel and prevent it from getting further damaged. I've actually had some of these crack before along the edge because I wasn't paying attention. I was in a hurry and I just go in there give it a lot of force and it still works it still holds it in place but you know it just doesn't look as good I guess so I'm gonna put this off to the side don't need that right now and that's good so here's the mylar flex I was talking about you can see it right here so <clears throat> once you've got that separated the rest of the controller will come apart real easily you just have to take the two halves kind of wiggle them apart it's usually held in place with some, uh, the, there's posts in the front that kind of snap in. So what I'll do is I'll take the flat blade screwdriver and lightly in between the middle of the seams, just kind of give it a little twist and turn until I get up under it like that. And then the two halves just come apart. No big deal. I'm gonna set the top half off to the side here. That just leaves us with our number pad and the carbon dots for that as well as the two side fire buttons. And they're just in these little plastic brackets. So they just pop right out of that. Just like that. And there we are, we're left with the rest of the controller and the Mylar Flex circuit. Now this one's already been cleaned previously, but uh, I will show you in the next video what I do to clean those up and get them tidied. Okay. So let me show you how I clean the uh, contact pads or the contact points on the Mylar Flex circuit. Uh, but before we do that, we also need to do a couple of quick tests to make sure that there's no breaks on the uh, Mylar Flex circuit because we'd hate to go to all the trouble of cleaning all this up, making it nice and shiny, only to find out that we have an internal trace that's broken and it wouldn't work for us anyway. So let me show you what I'm gonna do here. First, we have to uh, take the Mylar Flex circuit out of the bottom controller housing and the way that you can do this is I'll usually start with the fire button side. Now, the fire buttons are actually held in place against the plastic housing using a very strong <laughs> double-sided tape. You can see part of the tape still left behind right there. The other part of it's on the controller. And that's like that on both sides, actually. Don't be afraid to give it some oomph to get it torn off, but do be careful because it is metallic traces inside of this uh, Mylar circuit, and it is possible to bend them and actually break them in the process internally, so do be careful a little bit. Okay, I've got those two separated. Now to get the rest of it off, 
I'm going to lift up under here where there's a support plate that holds the rest of the mylar. See that? And then in turn, it's plugged in to the uh, cable connector inside the bottom housing here. So all I got to do is just kind of take it and just lift it right out like that. I'm going to take the rest of this and put it off to the side. Don't need it for right now. And here we are with the Mylar Flex Circuit. I'm going to go ahead and to make it easier to clean this, I'm going to remove this uh, plastic support off of it. This is also held in place with tape, as you can see. And actually, it's usually sticky enough that uh, you can reuse it, so you don't have to worry about uh, putting any new tape down or anything. I might, though, when I go to reassemble it, I'll sometimes put another piece of tape on the bottom side of it just to make sure the keypad's held down in place well. Okay, set that off to the side. And here we are with the flex circuit itself. I'm just going to kind of set this down like that. Now, <clears throat> the problem here is that you have non-responsive buttons, and there's a number of reasons for that, but the most common one is just corrosion that builds up on these uh, metal traces on the metal flex circuit. And in fact, on these, the fire buttons don't look too bad, but I do recall that they weren't working very well, so we might have a broken trace that I might need to, to look and see. Hopefully I don't. If there's a broken trace, there really isn't any good way to repair these, at least not that I found personally. So yeah, if I ever find that I have a flex circuit with a broken internal metal trace in it, I'll just, I'll just replace it. Um, Best Electronics sells replacement uh, flex circuits. Uh, you can also get them sometimes in bulk purchases on eBay. I've done that before, which is handy for repairing a whole bunch of them at once. But, uh, but we can test that. So to do that, we will need to use a digital multimeter. So, I'm going to get my meter here. I'm going to set it to continuity and uh, diode mode. <clears throat> and I'm going to check a few points. Now, the most common thing, again, that I said that fails is usually the side fire buttons and the top row buttons. And the cool thing about this is the top row buttons share the same ground point, and then all of the fire buttons share the same but different ground point. And then each pair of fire buttons has the same trigger line on the uh, keypad section up here. So obviously the two bottom buttons on left and right share the same trigger and the top ones as well. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna do a quick continuity test between these to make sure everybody's talking and to make sure that I have good connection, not only from the contact points where the buttons meet and where they connect to the controller cable, but also from one side to the other since they're all shared together. So that's what I'm going to do here real quick. Okay, those will test out. So obviously I've got good connectivity from both sets of traces on both the left and right between the buttons. But I also need to make sure that those traces are good all the way to the connector or to the cable connector as well. So that's what I'm going to check real quick. Okay, all the ground points are good. Now I'm going to try the trigger lines. Okay, good on that side. Good. So all the fire buttons and all of the traces from them to the controller cable are in good shape. So I should be good there. Now I'm going to check the ground points between each of the top row pins. Okay, those are good. And I'm also going to check their ground point as well. Excellent. And then they also have their own individual trigger lines as well.
Okay, so all my traces are good on this flex circuit, so I should be in good shape. All I really need to do now is just to clean it up. So to clean the flex circuit, this is where your Q-tip comes into play, plus your alcohol, if you want to go that route. Um, and I usually do because this is usually enough to get the job done. But in instances where there might be additional corrosion or they're really just really cruddy looking, then that's where I might have to break out my deoxid. And if that fails, then the other option I will use is I will use a pink pearl eraser like you would get at school. You know, that one that's about two, three inches long and about an inch, inch and a quarter wide. Those work really good as well. Uh, and a pink pearl eraser is a great soft abrasive you can use to get additional gunk off of the uh, contact points on the Mylar flex circuit. However, if you do use an eraser like that, it's important that you then follow it up with another cleaning of some alcohol just to get the eraser residue off of the uh, Mylar flex circuit. So I'm gonna to try to clean this one up first using just the alcohol. And before I do that, I thought I'd show you some of these uh, contact points. Because I can already tell that it looks like the number two button and the number three button on this one, possibly the number one button, have got some corrosion on them. And the fire buttons look okay, but just because something looks okay and it tests out and meters properly, doesn't mean it actually is clean. So we'll just take a quick look at those. And you can see there's not much of a shine that comes off of any of these. And I don't know if I can get this to, if the camera will zoom in enough, but you can see the discoloration from the corrosion, all those little darkened spots, that's corrosion and oxidation on these contact points. Same thing with the uh, fire buttons as well. In fact, you can even see a little ring circle there on this one where the rubber contact pad has been there for a while and just kind of leaves residue behind. Yeah. So we're gonna get these cleaned up and uh, I'll show you what uh, what the results are like. I'm going to clean it with the alcohol first, and this part I will speed up. Okay. So I just went over this entire controller pad, or this Mylar Flex circuit rather, with uh, my Q-tip and some alcohol. And uh, you can see that the Q-tip is pretty nasty looking. Yep, that all came off of those contact points. So that's just oxidation and gunk and grime over the years. And already the uh, Mylar Flex circuit looks a lot better. Those areas I showed you before with the discoloration, the discoloration isn't there anymore and it's more shiny and has more uniform look as far as uh, the coloring goes on the uh, traces. So now what I'm gonna do is uh, kind of dry this up a little bit. And I'm going to clean it again using my deoxid. And you'll see that even though I've gotten this pretty clean, in fact, this is Pro I can, uh, this is probably clean enough for sure that it would still work as it is right now, um, provided we did the rest of the repair we need to do. But yeah, this uh, Mylar Flex Circuit's actually in really good shape, but there's still yet more corrosion on it. So that's what I'm gonna do next is get another fresh Q-tip and clean it with my deoxid. Okay, so I just went over the whole thing again, this time with my deoxid on some Q-tips, and let me show you the results. And it's not as bad, obviously, but you can still see that there was still some crud on it, and even when I went back over it with the dry side, there was a little bit more residue that came off. And that was just on the uh, deoxid that was left over on top, so good thing I, get to, I went and collected that up. 
And of course the controller pad itself, or the Mylar Flex Circuit rather, here's another Q-tip. I'm just gonna kinda make sure I get all this stuff off of here. Looks really good now. So, get it off my mat here. Let's see if these will show up. Yeah, you can see they're a lot shinier now. Uh, that's not a trick of the light. That's that's just what clean contacts look like. So you can see that uh, they're all uniform in color. We don't have that uh, darkening of the discoloration I had before. See? Looking a lot better there, huh? Much better. There's the other side fire buttons. So yeah, nice and clean. So that takes care of the Mylar circuit. So the other thing to clean next is actually the carbon dots themselves on all of the buttons. So I'm gonna put this off to the side. And this is where the cardstock comes back into play again. So I'm gonna kind of set these off to the side. It'll be easier and I can show you. So what you do is, is uh, you take <clears throat> the buttons and again, they have these little carbon pads on the bottom of them. So what you need to do is we need to get the grime and residue that's collected over the years off the bottom of these buttons. You already saw what came off of the Mylar Flex circuit, so you can only imagine what's also on these buttons. Well, we can show you. Take the cardstock that you have or that you uh, retrieved, or again, you can use an old envelope. Uh, that works as well. And just take one of the buttons in your hand and just press up against the cardstock and make like about a three inch line down it. Like that. I'm going to do that with all the buttons. So I'm going to speed this up again. Okay, so you just saw me run each of these uh, carbon pads over this cardstock. And the reason why I did that is because the cardstock makes a good, kind of an abrasive surface without causing too much damage and wearing the, con the uh, pads down too much. You obviously wouldn't want to use sandpaper and I have used cardboard in the past, <clears throat> excuse me. But uh, I think that might be a little too rough as well. So again, cardstock and envelope paper seems to work really well. And if you take a look, you can see all those streaks that the carbon dots leave behind. And that's the old dirt and grime that was on the bottom of them. And you don't really have to make more than basically just a single pass uh, for each one of them. So I'm gonna get this out of the way. And uh, that just leaves us with <clears throat> basically bare carbon dot pads ready for resurfacing. And uh, to resurface them, that's where the foil tape comes in. So I'll show you that next. Okay, so now we've cleaned up the controller, we've cleaned the contact pads, or the uh, uh, the contacts on the Mylar Flex circuit that's part of the 5200 controller. Now what we need to do is we need to add a new conductive surface to the carbon dots on the bottoms of the rubber pads here. And again, I just use the old tried and true foil tape method. Now. I've heard of some people just taking normal tin foil and trying to super glue it on, and I guess they're able to make that work. I never had any real success with that. So again, I use this foil tape that's got uh, this 3M adhesive on it. It's basically exactly what it sounds like. It's tape made of foil, and it is quite conductive. So I have a, a piece here that's probably, I don't know, just, just about... Uh, probably about two inches, a little more than two inches by about an inch and a half or so. And this will be more than enough to provide uh, new surface pads or new surface contact points for all of these uh, carbon dots here. So here's what you do. You take your scissors that you had that I mentioned earlier, take the sheet of uh, foil tape, and you just want to cut strips off of it. I don't know, maybe about uh, not quite a quarter of an inch. And you won't need too many, because again, you can you can get quite a few. Um, from off of here, so I'm just going to cut a few of these off here right now, 
So you can see I've got these, these nice little foil strips here. And then I'm going to cut them again. So, like that. And I'm going to cut to, I don't know, probably about maybe another quarter inch. So I guess, you know, I'm making little quarter inch by quarter inch foil squares here. They can start to get kind of sticky on your scissors. So you'll need to make sure that you clean your scissors off as you do this. Okay, so I've got a few of these cut out and made. So what do I do with these little guys? <clears throat> well, I'll just start with the fire buttons first because why not? They're right here. All I'm going to do is just take the squares, if I can get it. It can be kind of tricky to pick up. Clearly, there we go. Okay. <laughs> so you pick up the little squares like this. And again, since you cleaned all the grime and the gunk off of the uh, carbon dot pads previously using the uh, card stock or an envelope, you've pretty much given these things a good surface to stick to. So I'm going to take the backing off, the paper backing off of this foil tape, and I'm just going to apply it one of these carbon dots and try to center it on there as much as I can and then to make sure it's on there good I'll usually take it and push it down on another hard surface I'm pushing it on a piece of glass I've got up here but just push it down on a good hard piece of surface make sure it sticks good and there you go you can see that I've got a nice little square foil there we go that covers that dot and it will stick on there pretty good for quite a while and I actually made these a little bigger than they needed to be um, I sometimes make them a tiny bit smaller it's one of those you know a little goes a long way kind of deals but you definitely want to make sure you can cover most of the surface of the uh, carbon dot because uh, you want to make sure that there's plenty of uh, area for it to make contact with all of the points on the mylar so yeah so there we are so both of those dots or both of the that fire buttons now ready to go so I'm just gonna do that uh, with the remaining ones here All right, and there we go. <clears throat> all new foil dots on all my little contact pads, ready to go. Numeric keypads ready. Start, stop, and reset. Or I'm sorry, start, pause, and reset, rather. Good to go, and both sets of fire buttons. So now uh, I'm ready to put this controller back together and give it a fire test, or a final test, and see how we're doing. Okay. So, I'm ready to put this controller back together and test my handiwork here. So, I'll just start by putting the fire buttons back into these little brackets. And they just fit in there anyway. No real particular way to do it. Now, I will mention at this point, this controller was pretty clean, so I'm not really worried about it. But if you have a controller that's got a lot of dirt and grime on the rubber itself, on the outside exterior, then I would advise that you go ahead and use like uh, a toothbrush and some warm soapy water and even just kind of soak these rubber contacts. And obviously you do this before you apply the, the foil tape on them, but uh, you go ahead and just kind of soak them and just kind of clean them in a sink and you know, like I said, on warm water and a detergent bath and uh, can really shine these things up again, make these buttons and, and things look like new. 
Um, you could also do it with the controller's housings as well. Just be careful and uh, try not to get any water inside the potentiometers that actually uh, actuate the analog controls inside. Okay, so I'm going to put this thing back together. The first thing I'm going to start with is going to be putting the uh, Mylar Flex circuit back in place. And again, I'm making sure that it's back on its little <clears throat> plastic uh, support tray here. There's two little peg holes that will pop up. There they are. And they're actually part of that tray, so you'll know how to get the Mylar lined up perfectly by just popping it in there. Now, if it, if it doesn't have it already, this originally came with a with like sticky tape underneath it holding it onto this tray. If that's worn off or if in your process of cleaning it uh, you took that off, that's where the double-sided scotch tape comes into play. You can just pull off like a little inch strip of that off and just apply it on there and that'll help you hold the Mylar Flex circuit down. In fact, I'll probably apply a little bit of it here even though there wasn't there, wasn't any there originally. It'll help to keep the buttons and keep the Mylar film uniform and held down properly. So I'm just peeling off like about a one inch piece here or so. And I'm just going to lay it on the tray like that and then push the mylar on top of it like that. That'll help hold that down. Now, <clears throat> to put the mylar circuit back in, I'll get these other pieces out of the way for the time being. It's not very difficult, but I will show you a couple things to do first. Again, using the double-sided tape. Tear off about a, I don't know, about a centimeter or so piece. Not much. Got some hairs on there, apparently. There we go. And uh, you're going to apply them against the back of the plastic here that the fire buttons rest up against. So just take this tape and just kind of set it on there like that. I'm going to put one on the other side as well. And the real reason or the main reason for doing this is to help hold the fire buttons down or the mylar circuits that the fire buttons sit on. Again, to hold it again against a, a flush uniform surface. So I've applied those there. Now I'm going to take the rest of the mylar flex circuit. Make sure I bend this part here back. And then I'm going to work with the connector pin first. And I'm just going to, this part can be a little tricky. It's not hard, but you just got to be careful with it. So all you have to do is just get it inserted right back into the slot where it came from. See if the camera will zoom in on that. And it can fight you a little bit when trying to do this. So you just got to kind of get your hands in there and just slide it in like that. Okay, and then once you've done that, carefully lift up. Actually, that whole assembly can be pulled up a little bit to get the mylar folded over for your fire buttons. Okay, pretty close like that. Now, the actual support bracket here will fit into these little holes. It'll be hard to show them on camera, but I'll try. You can see those little support posts. Well, there's little holes on the inside, some studs, bosses I think they're called, inside the controller that it'll snap into just like that. And that'll hold it down in place. And then the next thing I want to do is I want to take the mylar section where the fire buttons were, and I'm going to need to line those up against that support, against the part of the plastic on the inside of the housing on the support, and up against my little double-sided tape to hold them in place. Now, the <clears throat> part of the the part of the flex circuit that the fire buttons contact has got a notch at the bottom of it. I think you can kind of see that in the film there. And there's also an accompanying notch. In the bottom of the plastic housing, you might just be able to see it right down here. So what you'll want to do is you're going to want to take that mylar tape and right where the notch is, you're going to want to line it up on that notch and then just push it up flat against the double-sided tape you applied. Just like that. That helps to line it up. 
And I'll do the same thing on the other side here. And we'll just get that. There we go. It is actually in there. This one has a little bit of a dimple on the, or a little curl on the end of it, so it, it looks like it's not in there right, but it is, I assure you. Okay. So, Mylar's back in place. Next thing we need to do is to put the two fire buttons back in, so I'm just going to take them in their brackets, just slide that back into the little grooves. Just like that. So those are good to go. And then we come to probably the more difficult part and confusing part of putting this controller back together. And that is with the numeric keypad. Again, those little dots I showed you before that come up through that black or the through the plastic support. Those same little dots will also be used to poke in and line up the number pad. That is if it doesn't fight me. Okay, that one's in. That one's in. Okay, so I've got that lined up. You can just make out the darker shadows there from where those little posts poke through. <clears throat> and then probably the hardest part is getting the top back on. Now it's really not that difficult if you know how to do this. And here's the secret. The secret is where the potentiometers are placed. And they have to be placed exactly as you see them here. You need the bottom potentiometer, which actually controls your left and right directions. That needs to be straight down in the six o'clock position. The upper potentiometer, which controls your up and down motion, needs to be right at the nine o'clock. Make sure I have them lined up. Right in the nine o'clock position, as you see here. Now, <clears throat> taking the top part of the controller, this is where it can get a little tricky because your number pad will move around and shift on you a little bit. Hold the controller in such a way that the actual controller handle is as centered as you can possibly make it in your hands. And you'll see that I kind of use my thumb and my index finger to kind of hold it in place while I'm supporting the rest of the, of the uh, top with my hand here. Now, there's a little slots on the sides. Let's see if I can make the light shine through. There you go. You can kind of see that there's openings on either the left and right side of the top of the controller top or the controller there where the uh, start pause and reset buttons went that's where this part of the mylar will slide through just like that I don't know if you can really see that I did that or not but there see just slide it right up through there now holding the controller straight as much as possible just go straight down on the controller slowly Make sure everything's kind of lined up. Start to push it all together. And then gently move the controller around and it'll drop in to where those potentiometers were. Perfect. That's exactly how it needs to go. And then finally, to finish this up, take another piece of your double-sided tape, place it along the top where the start, pause, and reset go. like here and that will be to help hold down the mylar flex circuit for the start pause and reset there just like that and then I'm going to take the start pause and reset buttons drop them back into place where they go Take the bezel that I popped off earlier, and I just push down on one side, and then push down on the other until it snaps together, snaps in place. Now you might have to push down on the buttons a little bit. Sometimes the, the rubber around the buttons will get caught under the bezel a little bit. Just give them a little push, kind of work them out a little bit. They'll, they'll, they'll go to where they need to. And then, finally, put your three screws back in. Now, 
What I would do at this point is, honestly, this will hold together really well as it is without the anchor screws on the bottom being applied. I would go ahead and test the controller now just to make sure that everything's still working and, and that everything responds the way you expect it to. Additionally, there might be some calibration that's required on the controller. There is a potentiometer inside the 5200 that can be adjusted for calibrating controllers. However, not all controllers are alike. In fact, uh, I've got four different ones here in front of me that I'm going to be working on in addition to this one. And I already tested them in my test program and every one of them had different resistance value readings uh, left and right and up and down. Now, they were within about eh, maybe about 10, 20 percent of each other, but still those slight variances can give you a headache when you're trying to play games like Popeye or Kangaroo or probably the worst offender is Bounty Bob Strikes Back. Uh, now that's a rare game, hardly anybody that I know, I don't own a copy of that, but uh, I do have a flash cart with that game on it and that is by far probably the best game to test is Bounty Bob. If you can make Bounty Bob move in every direction and do what he needs to do, then you've got a good calibrated controller. Another good game to test with fire button functionality to make sure both top and bottom and everything's working is the game Defender as it uses both sets of buttons. Um, I also like to use the game Star Wars, the arcade game. Uh, that'll test all of my directional uh, analog controls uh, plus my start, pause, and reset and it'll test my fire buttons as well to make sure they're nice and responsive. Uh, another good game I test is I uh, use the game Blaster which is a prototype that was never finished but I had Atari Age make me a cart of that game. It's actually an excellent game. I should do a separate video review on that sometime. But that's a good one to test as well. So yeah, I'll go ahead and put this controller back together and uh, then I'll show some uh, footage of how well it works. And here we are with the repaired joystick ready to test. I have the Pete's Diagnostic Test cartridge up and running right now. And this is good for not only checking the extremes of the controller itself, up and down and what have you, but also uh, excellent for testing all the function buttons. Now, the Atari 5200 being a uh, simplified scaled down Atari 8-bit computer, some of the actual keys translate to key presses on the keyboard of the computer systems. So as an example, I'll test the numeric keypad buttons here. Here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, which you saw changing there, and zero. But the asterisk key is actually the letter A, uh, interpreted as the letter A, and the hash key is interpreted as the letter B. Additionally, the start, pause, and reset keys up at the top relate to C, D, and E on the 8-bit computer keys. So you can see that the Atari uh, 5200 controller and how the mapping is as far as the interpretation. So the only other things really to test would be fire button functionality. Now if you hit the bottom fire button on this test, it'll put it into a calibration uh, screen as you see here. And if you hit the top fire buttons, it puts it into this uh, grid where you can test the extremes of the uh, analog control. So yeah, and then go through the rest of the tests. So this controller appears to be 100%. Just to make absolutely sure, I will put in uh, my copy of Blaster right here that I had made up, and we'll test that as well. Okay, so again, we can make sure that the buttons are working. If I hit the hash key, it'll switch between the player select. So if I push on the hash key, it'll uh, switch to player select, like that. And obviously, if I were to hit the uh, asterisk key, it'll change between difficulty levels. like that. And then to reset, I'll just push the reset key. We can see that the screen resets. If I push start, the game starts up. If I hit the pause key, it pauses like it's supposed to. And then finally to check and make sure all the buttons work, 
I can just play a quick round here. And again, with the game Blaster, every single fire button will fire off shots. So I'm just pushing each one of these uh, sets of fire buttons on the left and right. Oh, I ran into that arch. That's not good. But yeah, I'd say this controller's working just fine. Doing exactly what we need to do. It can't help me with my gameplay. That's my fault. But uh, this controller is awesome, ready to go. So that's it. That's how you repair a 5200 controller, or at least refurbish it using the uh, tape foil or the foil tape method that I've used for the last couple years. So yeah, thanks for watching.